Last week, we had Grandmaster Daryl Vidal with us discussing the attributes and evolution of Kempo. Master Vidal is often recognized for his appearance in The Karate Kid, but even more impressive, he is an accomplished martial artist with extensive experience in a variety of systems including Kempo, Wing Chun, and Filipino martial arts. He is a seasoned competitor, holds a 10th degree black belt in Kempo, and he's a member of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. Now he's back with us today to talk about his experience with Filipino stick fighting, some of the critical aspects that are often overlooked, and how to get the most out of your training. What is your experience with the Filipino martial arts and why do you think it is um, among the top of the martial arts for weapons combat? I started uh, very young. It was one of the first uh, arts that I was ex actually exposed to because my parents uh, used to have a, a guy that they would call a faith healer. Uh, and whenever they had you know, a sprain or a, an ailment, we would go see this guy. And uh, we called him the faith healer, but he was actually uh, a Filipino arts person. He would make elixirs and do massage. And after I told him, I talked to him uh, some years uh, after I had become an adult, he basically said he's like a chiropractor. He does bone alignment and, you know, massages. Uh, but but he had some special talents and he taught it with his kids because, you know, he could, he could take your hands and, and kind of feel your palms and say, oh, look, you've got hemorrhoids or <laughs> you have asthma or, you know, I don't know how they did that. Maybe that's based in something real. Maybe a chiropractor knows that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I don't have hemorrhoids. So, uh, but they would, they, they would do some, some stick fighting. And that's where I first kind of saw it and heard the clack clacking of the sticks. <clears throat> then it wasn't until um, we moved to, to Chino California, where we met up with a neighbor who had some experience with stick fighting uh, and had taken classes with Danny and Santo. Uh, and so that was my first exposure. And we would use sticks and, and start learning, you know, some of the more common pattern drills, you know, like the six count and, uh, you know, blocking and blocking some disarm. But it was more rudimentary stuff. And he didn't have an uh, official rank. And then probably over the years, I think I've counted uh, and uh, I probably had as many as five or six other people who I trained with. Uh, some of the people that I, I would train with would would be what I call seminar guys. You know, they uh, they would go to a lot of seminars. Uh, and then what I found when I would learn from these guys is, you know, they have one or two things that I could get from them. And then they didn't really have a lot of other depth. Uh, so I would take those drills and, and then use them and, uh, and, and learn them. And then there was uh, one guy in particular who uh, spent a lot of time with a um, stick fighting guy, Tim Tackett. I probably heard his name. Uh, and, uh, and I learned a ton from him. We would do, you know, all kinds of different drills. We would do pattern drills, we reaction drills, and pressure testing, and blade drills. I probably uh, garnered the most of my experience from him uh, and, and the most of my practical experience. So I really <clears throat> absorbed it, but I could never say, you know, this is Cali, this is Arnis, this is Eskrima, this is, you know, this system or that system. So uh, over the time, I would teach people uh, what I know uh, without really having, you know, a name for it all until I finally decided I wanted to teach it, uh, give some formal instruction, even though I don't have this kind of certified ranking. Uh, so I developed my own curriculum based on what I, I know, uh, and it, it's pretty deep. I mean, it's, it has, you know, six levels and it has, you know, all these, all the things that I've learned, you know, everything from pattern drills to reaction drills, like I said, uh, and I've made it a, 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 a kind of a complete system with, you know, double sticks, with single sticks, with, with, with knives and stick and knife and empty hand. So I, I've, I've, I've created that whole curriculum and then I established it in here in Murrieta under the Murrieta Stick Fighting Club. Uh, so that's how I teach it. Uh, that's the curriculum. You know, I don't proclaim myself to be, you know, grandmaster of, you know, Filipino stick fighting. It is really, I'm teaching the Murrieta Stick Fighting Club curriculum. And if that's not good enough for you, too bad, you know, <laughs> you can still come in here and I'll still smash your fingers with, <laughs> with the best of them. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way that I do it. 
Well, what can, what can new students joining your class expect in terms of starting out and what early classes are like versus what they might find in a traditional college school or, or another school like that? Well, I don't know how they would be different, uh, but I think uh, what they can expect is that we'll be banging sticks right from the start. Uh, when uh, One of the main things that's different about Filipino martial arts is you start with weapons uh, and then you learn how to transition from, from you know, two sticks and one stick to eventually uh, bladed weapons and then to the empty hand. So it's kind of like reversed from karate where you start, you know, empty hand and then you gravitate towards weaponry. Um, and then that's so, you know, that's why I don't teach kids because you're probably going to get your head or your fingers smashed early on because, you know, we're hitting sticks and, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're getting, you uh, live work done with different types of sticks right i know i try to you know some people like the little skinny ones but i always tr make sure that we're we're training with different weights and 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 uh you know types of wood so that you're you're, you're feeling the different types of reaction from from striking with sticks and you know ultimately you get you're getting your hand smashed we wear gloves you know when we do certain drills so that you can hit them in the hand and hit them in the knuckles and pretend to cut them in the hand and cut them with the knuckles uh, so that we're, we're trying to, to do a level of that more practical um, you know, experiential training. So why is doing it reverse a more practical way versus like having them do just the motions with the empty hands first just to get the motions down and then adding the weapon in? What is the reversal benefit? Yep, it's a good question. Um, I think, I think um, the way I might express it is... Um, is, is the one is 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 karate uh, is kind of form based. You know, we, we, you learn a form. You know, a stance, a method of doing these things. Uh, but uh, thick fighting is flow based. You know, what we're trying to do is develop uh, an understanding of the flow of the stick. You know, as uh, because the stick is 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 a completely different uh, manifestation of weaponry versus the hand um the stick has momentum uh and inertia uh and flexibility uh and, and distance right so there's all these things that that make it better but it's very different from the empty hand uh and the flow aspect of it go, comes from the end of the stick and the momentum of the stick but it also translates to your footwork and your movement uh so by learning to stick first, you're you're learning a longer range um, uh, interaction with your opponent uh, because you're farther away. Uh, and then, as you learn to uh, get closer, either by uh, getting close to a grappling uh, situation, a disarm, or a takedown, now you're closing on your opponent, and that that's changing, you know, kind of the interaction with it. So. Um, it's kind of like moving from long range interaction into, you know, closer, closer range. So I, and, and I don't want to uh, leave the impression that I think uh, you have to start with weaponry, but it is the way that we, we indoctrinate you is starting you with the sticks and feeling the stick and, and trying to learn, uh, you know, how to not only not only manipulate uh, and create the, the momentum and the energy of the stick, but also how to feel, uh, deal with the momentum after a strike and, and the follow through. You know that uh, if they don't, if someone uses nunchucks, but doesn't know how to deal with the follow through, they're going to, you know, hit themselves on the elbow or in the head. And, and it's the same with sticks. You know, if, if you don't know what you're doing and you hit that stick, it's going to bounce back and hit you right in the head. So, you know, there's all, there's that whole aspect of dealing with the flow, learning learning the flow, and then dealing with the flow and, and the reaction of the stick. And there's that expression where people say that you know a weapon is just an extension of, of a limb. Do you feel that that's Absolutely. an oversimplification, or do you think that's a fair statement? No, I, I think it's a fair statement. I definitely teach that in Kempo uh, when we when we're teaching about using the bow staff or or using uh, any other implement. You know that's true, pretty much true for any other implement, but. Uh, in this case, um, since the stick can be of varying uh, densities uh, and flexibilities, um, you have to know how to deal with that. You know how that how that stick reacts. So it it, it does vary a lot in, in terms of you know what you're using 
Uh, in fact, a lot of, uh, I don't have one right with me, but a lot of uh, uh, Filipinos will use a very light rattan stick, very uh, thin, you know, let, like let's say it's three quarters of an inch thick rattan uh, with the skin shaved off. So this creates a very light uh, stick that uh, bends a lot. Well, you know what? Go ahead and hit me with it. <laughs> it's not going to hurt me unless you really know how to apply that stick to the right target, and, you know, in the right way. Otherwise, you know, you're going to flail around with it. I'm probably going to knock it out of your hand and you're taking it off your hand and hit you with it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned the six count drill. Um, for those who are not familiar with it, what is it for? And like, what are the core principles that it teaches? Okay. So, yeah, one of the main uh, pattern drills that we work on is called the six count and uh it, it starts from this the stance you know i don't have two six but you know it's using the sequence of movements so i'm mimicking them here right here with empty hands but uh so the the angles are coming you're, you're we're working with these two basic angles right here and I'm, I'm throwing the sticks at my opponent uh and following through with this this standardized pattern uh, and what we're learning is the flow of the sticks controlling the flow of the sticks but also building uh, muscle memory in in attack angles and the correct uh, the, the, the correct uh, wrist position for when you're you're hitting something. I, I have something here. This is a little practice knife that I, I have on my desk, <laughs> along with my balisong and my battle axe over here. But you know, a lot of people work don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the uh, understanding of the position your wrist needs to be in. Uh, if when you're hitting something, so you know you'll see people hitting, uh, 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 or you know, uh, uh, uh. but um, you know, in, in actuality, when you when you make a strike, you know, your wrist has to be in in a, in this position as you as you follow through, uh, and so that's one of the core things you're learning when when we're using this pattern drill. Plus, that pattern becomes a muscle memory drill, so. If you came at me, let's say with this, you know, number one strike over here, I'm going to use this block, and then I'm probably going to fall into that pattern to hit you, you know, six plus times at, in in various targets coming off of this this one, you know, um, muscle memory drill that I have. So there's there's a lot of different um, uh, uh, pattern drills, but the six count is probably the most common one that you'll see if you do a, a search on YouTube. You'll see everybody from karate people to, you know, a, a, a lot of Filipino people doing the six count. Uh, you'll see a lot of iterations, a lot of different methods for using it, a lot of different footwork that goes along with it. And there's a lot of different height zones. I noticed like there's the heaven six, the high six, and then the standard and the low. Do the core principles right. and mechanics change for the different heights or is it the same? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, one of the concepts is about angles of attack. So, uh, you know, the heaven six, for instance, is all using these one and two angles. The, 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 the straight six, which incorporates the low strike, uh, incorporate this, this horizontal angle of attack. Uh, and then when you get down to the earth six, you know, we're using these, these, these downward angles uh, and even uh, getting down low and then hitting at an upward angle. That's what they're, they're really incorporating. But it's on a, a constant movement type drill. Uh, a lot of Kempo systems have stick fighting. Uh, and I've, I've always kind of, I don't want to say been critical of it, but I've always been skeptical of it when they say that they're mixing Cali or, or Filipino stick fighting with, with karate, because every time I see it, it tends to have degraded into this one, two, three, four. And they're really learn they're learning the pattern, but they're not learning the flow. The flow, uh, and so if uh, if you did that to me, you know, right when you stopped, you know, I would probably just attack you with a with a kempo <laughs> technique. I'm glad that you mentioned that because in the previous conversation, and I've been trying to think this about in my head, you made the comment that the footwork and, and stick fighting and the footwork and kempo are incompatible. Um, how is that mm. so? And is there any way to marry them together? Yeah. Okay. I, I might I might have misspoke if I say incompatible, but I would say completely different. Um, and um, to the point where I don't want to have my lower belt students take both from me. Uh, and and for one of the reasons is if you come to my karate class, 
I'm going to tell you how to stand in a cover right in a very structured way. I'm going to say, you know, your feet are going to be this far apart. You know, your center line will be here. You're going to be one inch off the center line. Your feet will be at this angle. Your knees will be like this. Your hands will be like this. Your shoulders will be like this. If you come to my stick biting class, I will say, well, there's no stance except that your right foot is forward or that your left foot is forward, you know, and then we're going to do all this, these work and I'll be very involved with the footwork but it'll never be in a structure of, okay, you're in this stance and then now you're in this stance. It's gonna be like, you're here and then you're gonna to transition to this move uh, by stepping this way. Um, it's always gonna be center of gravity. It's always gonna be based on you know a, a center of gravity, but uh, it's never gonna be like 50% weight forward, you know, toe facing out this way. Uh, our general concepts are like, both feet are aiming in the same direction. Okay, and they're aiming at the target. So those are the kind of the, the principles that we talk about. And, and that's why I say they don't, you know, they're dissimilar. So it's, it's less a regimented program. It's a, it's a much more fluid concept than with the footwork. Absolutely. That's why I say I've talked about flow, you know, flow base. It's, you know, your, your body is moving according to where your target is. And if you're moving oblique, you know, this is, you know, through your kepo is, you know, you move at an oblique angle and now your attack, your target is over here. You can't just move over here and, and you know, keep attacking in this direction here. You, your, your, uh, your target is just as fluid as you are. So, uh, you know, your ability to, to, to address the target and where you're attacking uh, is just as important, but it's not through a structured stepping. It's through uh, flow-based uh, stepping, so flow-based footwork. So what are some good practice habits a student can use to get from that robotic pattern drill that they might have learned at the beginning and get more intertwined with the footwork and more of a smoother flow? Well, you know, it's funny that you said I was just thinking about it because, you know, how many times have you learned a, you know, a one-step drill, right, where you say, okay, I'm going to come in with this punch, uh, then you're going to do this inward block and, you know, this technique, uh, and you find that you're not – stepping according to the the technique you know the technique says uh you're just going to step forward uh, and then you're going to do this move and then you're going to step back and you're going to do this move well what if that doesn't work you know are you are you held to that well if i'm doing the short technique correctly and i'm going to be judged by that then I have to figure out how to make it, you know, work, even though, you know, my, my opponent is shorter or taller or rounder or whatever it may be. Uh, so, you know, it really is uh, fluid according to the needs of the situation. Uh, and, and it's expected to be a, a free flow as opposed to, you know, a structured drill. And I like how you mentioned where you have your students train with different weight sticks. And that's something that's missing in a lot of classes, especially Kempo classes. So how would that translate to, do you think that actually helps a student, whereas if they're in a real situation that they might be able to pick up another item, whether it be a stick or an umbrella or something, how can that knowledge and practice translate to an everyday item or tool that they can get their hands on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, Bruce Lee used to talk about, well, I could roll up a newspaper and, and use that in the place of a stick. Uh, if I have a very light stick, I'm going to probably, uh, I'm probably going to hit you twice as many times as I would with a heavier stick for multiple reasons. One is that I can move it faster. Uh, but two is that it's not going to inflict the same type and amount of damage that the heavier stick might do. Uh, but to translate that to, um, <clears throat> to, uh, you know, other implements that you might pick up, uh, once we start going from two sticks and then to one stick or to a heavier stick, a shorter stick, a bladed weapon, you know, a pen, uh, you'll start to see the ver variances of both range and striking, uh, you know, striking the, the part that you're using to strike with. So if I have this knife, you know, I know that I'm going to want to uh, try to strike with the blade or the point. I'm not going to try to strike with the back uh, or I'm not going to strike with, you know, this part unless that's, if that's my particular, you know, uh, technique. Uh, and so it's it's kind of prepping your your hands and your your body to uh, deal with the different you know complements of what that weapon might offer. Yeah, and this is so many varieties because it was something like an umbrella. Not only do you have a stick object, but now you have something that has a hook at the end of it too. 
Absolutely. And you have something that'll probably break. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the head will come off, and, oh, and then the, the thing open up, and I can't see. You know, there's, there's so many things that can or, happen. Or you can open up and obscure their vision, too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You can use it you know, like that. I'm sure that I'm sure somebody in the Kingsman did that, right? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting because, and that's always fascinating to me, too, is like, at least in the American camp, we don't really have too many official weapons. Like, you know, uh, Okinawan arts, they've got their traditional weapons, but... For some reason, I've noticed that Kempoists are always drawn to the Kali sticks, and it's been everyone I know, every, all my instructors I've ever taught with it. Do you think that there's something inherently attractive to it based on the style of martial art, or do you think it's a product of media like, say, the perfect weapon that popularized it? Why do you think so many Kempoists are drawn to the stick fighting? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a question I've actually pondered myself. And I, know, I think, you know, I've only seen the perfect weapon once, so I, I don't know it uh, by rote like I know Enter the Dragon. But I will tell you that in Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee had a scream of sticks, or they were called a scream of sticks. But really, they're two, two big black sticks. And, and the way that I would describe his use of them would not be uh, a scream alike. I, I would say he's, you know, he's hitting people with two sticks because he's, he's, you know, he's fast and he's doing these things. But I don't recognize pattern drills or patterns that he's using uh, or the combinations or, 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 you know, things that I might, I might use if, uh, if I was in you know, a fighting situation, of course, I don't think it, you know, it might not look like what Bruce Lee was trying to accomplish uh, in, in that, but to get back to your question, I think, I think there's, there's legend or out there that says that there's a natural connection between the two. In fact, uh, I think it's Jesse Encamp actually has a video that says that that they have a common, uh, a, a, you know, a common root or a common le uh, history. Uh, but I, I don't see that. I don't see it in the flow. I don't see it in the way that I teach it. Uh, but but he did show a, 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 you know, a pattern drill that we use. Sombrata. It's, it's, a, it's a short Sombrata drill. Uh, and I saw him using it, but I've seen it, you know, appear in many, many uh, self-defense uh, videos, uh, videos of people using uh, knife fighting uh, with Filipino uh, techniques. Uh, but I don't find that as a parallel in Kempo. And, and like I said, when uh, I visit other studios who are teaching uh, sticks um, and they, for instance, I see them do a kata. I, this has happened many times. I, I see uh, a, a karate competitor go to a tournament, do a kata with double sticks, and they'll do this mechanical six count. I think it's, they have to do it. I don't know why. Uh, but it, to me, that is not the Filipino stick fighting way. It is a karate method of using two sticks. Um, I've also actually seen you know, some karate videos where they have two sticks or one stick. Uh, and then they'll show, okay, uh, like if you came with this angle over here, um, if I was doing it using my sigmating club, I would, you know, use this or this type of block, a roof block or a shield block. Well, they would have that, um, a more mechanized movement for that. So they would have this or they would do this as the block or this is the block or this is the block. Uh, but it would be much more mechanical, much less flow based. But I could see that they learned it from, probably learned it from a stick guy. So I don't know. I can't answer that question. I, I ponder it myself. <laughs> are there any martial arts that you feel are more suited to blend with stick fighting? I, I think, uh, I think, I think uh, boxing and Muay Thai uh, are would because they're not using, you know, a structured karate type base, right? Uh, in boxing and Muay Thai, we're getting power off of the body moving forward while you're striking, as opposed to the body's connection to the ground in a, in a static, uh, you know, uh, uh, transition where you're, I'm hitting you, and it's because my strong base is how I'm reflecting or uh, uh, imposing my power on you. Whereas if I hit you with the right cross, my body may be moving and I'm coming off my heel and I'm, and I'm actually standing on the ball of my rear foot moving forward. So that, that power is projected 
from my body moving, not by my, my body being static. So I think that is tends to be uh, more similar to you know my stick fighting, where um, my body is moving as I'm striking, uh, and then we're moving into another move as I as I continue to strike. Uh, whereas in karate, you know, I'm going to hit you here, I'm going to move this way, I'm going to hit you here. But most of my my striking moves are not a uh, combination of striking and, and transitioning body at the same time. Now, a lot of martial arts, since we're talking about meshing weapons with the other styles, a lot of karate systems and self-defense systems will implement self-defense techniques against firearms or knives. And to be quite honest, a lot of them, and Kempo included in many ways, is lacking. Do you feel that uh, Filipino stick fighting is a lot more of a practical art for weapons self-defense against items such as that? You know, I'm not going to you know, say that one's better than the other, but, uh, you know, since since we're dealing with the weaponry right up front, I would say that uh, the, the Filipino uh, practitioner uh, is more ready for the high speed movement of a implement coming at them. And, and you can you, you get a uh, I think uh, uh, Inosanto calls it retina retention, you know, where your eyes are used to. Uh, seeing the, the, the outer edge of the arc, uh, and then you, you start to, to uh, react based on that as opposed to something that's coming at you from, from uh, at close distance, close range, or, or, or short trajectory like this. Uh, so you're better, you're more able to deal with it. Um, the, the realistic Filipino stick fighter, knife fighter, will tell you, you don't ever want to get into a knife fight. You know, you're going to get cut. You may die. You know, so, you know, I always warn my students when we're training is, first of all, you know, when we have a practice weapon, always treat it just like a gun, always treat it like it's a live blade. So if, if I see you, you know, take this knife and hold it this way, I'm like, hey, you just cut yourself. You know, uh, if, if you came in and then and you actually cut me, I'm going to proclaim you cut me. I'm cut, uh, you know, because I always try to to create that level of realistic, you know, any touch uh, with the tip of the, or the edge of that blade, you're cut and now you're bleeding. So <clears throat> I think, I think the, the way that we deal with that is more practical because when we do our karate training with a knife, it's like you step forward and he's going to do this one stab. It's like, well, you know, that never happens, right? I'm going to come in, I'm going to stab you, or I'm going to stab you like this, or I'm going to come up behind you and cut you from the throat. You know, it's just, it's so much more lethal uh, in the way that people, you know, use and, and use a knife that uh, I think I agree with you that, uh, you know, I think they, um, they're, they're more, they're just rudimentary. We, uh, the, the karate uh, re response to the knife fight is, is just, it's rudimentary. It's not. It's not without value, but it's it's rudimentary. So it'd be fair to say that the best defense against weapons is really to understand how the how they'll use the weapons first, understand what their limits and capabilities are, so that way there's at least an under, a better understanding there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You can't go. You can't go learn a bunch of knife techniques and then think that you're going to be able to use it without you know getting cut. And what do you think about the drills that people do, like with the chalk or the marker, and try to do the marking on them? Do you think that's an effective way to train? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, it shows it shows contact, you know, uh, and, and it'll, it'll it will uh, it will force you to try to avoid getting cut and making contact. So it, it'll expose that, you know, so I think it's value in that. We talked about this once before in private messaging, but um, we did the episode a while back about that electric taser knife. Oh yeah, and yeah. Um, you have but, it there. Yeah, I have it right here. What I find interesting though is like, because you know, in class, you know, we we don't use real blades, or we use like the dull metal blades or the wooden blades, and mm -hmm. it always feels like there's a sense of complacency with it because there's no real threat in a classroom setting. And right, right. this is advertised as a self defense tool, which I don't really see it as a tool because it's it's basically it's plastic, but it's got along the edge right here, it's got like um, it's it's got electrical contact. So when you actually activate it. It's supposed to be a taser, but um, it doesn't really work as such. But as far as a training tool, I love the psychological aspect that comes with it because we've done this in class, and there's, it's a major step up from a wooden knife to when you have your training partner all of a sudden coming at you with a... Your brain is like, I don't, don't, I don't want it to touch me, and it just seems to heighten the level a little bit. Um, what is yeah, your opinion on something like that? Well, I, I agree with you is that it, it can be uh, valuable for training, uh, but as a self-defense weapon, it 
it might, you know, give you a false sense of security because uh, if you're a big dude coming at me and I tase you with that, I don't think it's going to drop you. You're probably still going to grab me and throw me across the room. Uh, but uh, from a training standpoint, yes, I mean, it, it's more definitely more threatening uh, and give uh, give that user the experience of threat, right? Because it's like you said, uh, you got a wooden knife, it's not going to hurt me. Uh, so, you know, you're very, you know, lackadaisical about how you do your technique. And if you're not doing it like we do, where any experience with the edge of the blade, you know, we call it out, uh, then, you know, you're going to become, uh, you know, you you won't be uh, threatened by by the blade. Now, I, when we use, when I use a, a practice blade, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut and you're going to feel it. You're going to feel, oh, that would have hurt. Uh, but you'll feel the, the, you know, the slicing action of what you're doing. Or if I get you with the point, there, there is a point there, uh, and it's not going to penetrate you uh, unless I <laughs> actually try to stab you with it. But uh, you'll feel it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this thing's not going to knock you out, but it, it has a bite to it. So I think it's got – I mean, it might be a deterrent in the self-defense situation, but I just like that, that all of a sudden that the brain goes to that don't touch me mode. Yeah, I, I think that's valuable. You know, if you if you feel a threat, I, I think uh, part of that training has to involve real fear. And so if that device, you know, creates some real fear and you shoot some adrenaline into your body and now you're experiencing, you know, nervousness, I think that's good. That, that's good. Do you have any advice for anybody who's looking to join a stick fighting school? Um, any, any things they should look for in an instructor? Any red flags to look out for? Uh, one, have an open mind because uh, when you go and initially look at, at stick fighting, uh, it, it might look, um, it might not look uh, as, as powerful uh, as an MMA or karate. You know, and if you go into an MMA gym, you're going to see people, you know, working the heavy bag and sparring in with gloves on inside a ring. You know, we're not going to have that. We're going to be clack clacking sticks. Uh, and it might seem a little tame, but, you know, those sticks will inflict a lot of pain. So just have an open mind about it. And then if you see a, a big variance from your, your martial or your karate training, you're, you know, you should expect that. And, and be, have your mind open to the fact that it's not all about, you know, this, this stance. It's, it's going to be more about, you know, what your body position and how vulnerable you are and how ready you are uh, to respond to something. Since, you know, we talk about movies sometimes, i got to get your opinion on this. When it comes to movies and weapon usage, I've got, I personally have two pet peeves. The first is, I hate it when movies, where a character has a weapon, and they deliver 20 good strikes to a bad guy's face, and they survive, and I'm looking at, you know, the perfect weapon on this one. And the second pet peeve is, you know, movies where the actors, like, the, the, the fighting is so choreographed, where it looks like they're more tr trying to tap each other's weapons versus actually trying to strike the body, like something you see in Star Wars. What are your pet peeves when it comes to weapons in movies? And are there any movies that you feel demonstrate more realistic weapons fighting? It's a great complex uh, question because uh, almost all the sword fighting you ever see is, is you know, it's stage, right? Um, uh, and some of my favorite ones like Princess Bride, you know, the sword fighting in the Princess Bride or any of those Errol Flynn, Robin Hood type of movies where they're doing clack, 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 the sword, it's, you know, no sword fighting is really like that. Uh, and I'm not a sword fighting expert, but I am a big fan of it. Uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, that is one of my pet peeves is the fact that uh, that sword fighting is so unrealistic when you see it in the movies. And I, I can only think of a couple of, of, of instances where the sword fighting is, is, is depicted uh, accurately. One of them is called the duelists and you may have never seen it, but it's actually one of, one of the original uh, movies by Ridley Scott. Uh, and um, and uh, who, who's in it? I can't even remember. Harvey Keitel. Uh, and they have, you know, a different sword fighting and it is sword fighting. They're going, you know, and he does uh, a short sword right into the guy and this one shot and it, it pierces his lung and he kind of goes down, you know, that's what it would be like. You know, it's not like, you go, shoot, 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 shoot. you go on forever and you go around in a circle. You know, it's really 
boom, one, he pokes him once in the, in the lungs and you fall over because that's how, that's how lethal it, it is, you know? So a lot of the times when I see weapons uh, used in movies, I think I have the same kind of pet peeve as, oh, you know, he hit him here. But then again, um, you know, the, and it's just like karate too, you know, the, the people are pretty tough, you know, one, one punch, uh, you know, and what to, uh, and one strike of a weapon to a person who trains is probably not going to take him out. Right. Where uh, if we were on the street and, and you cold cock a guy who doesn't train, he's going down, right. He's going to fall flat on his head. He doesn't know how to roll up and tuck his chin and all these things. But if you, you're in a bar and it's an MMA guy who's been training. You're probably not going to hurt the guy. You know, it's going to take three guys to get, get it, to kick him out of the bar because he's going to be roughing up people. You know, even if, if you finally get him, he's going to be hurting people on the way out. Uh, so those are one of my pet peeves is, is people um, that, you know, or when it's pre, it, when it looks like, you know, and even John Wick does this is, you know, he hits him once he cut and the guy's done. Uh, and, you know, you need to hit a guy multiple times or really cold cock him clean uh, before he's out of the fight. And then uh, and then he'll come back, you know. So <clears throat> I think those are one of the things that I like to I, I enjoy and not enjoy seeing in, in movies. I like when you mentioned Princess Bride. Because there's movies like Star Wars where the, the sword fighting is like the spectacle of the scene. And you could tell like there, it's, it's all about the dazzle and the acrobatics of the, of the lightsabers hitting each other. But with something like The Princess Bride, and I think we see this mirrored in a lot of martial arts films, is that particular scene, it's not realistic, but it's telling the story. We're getting a lot of character development with that, with their actions and the sword Absolutely. fighting. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that takes back to like the martial arts films, like like Pat Johnson. The one reason I love his choreography so much, especially I grew up with the Karate Kid, Ninja Turtles, and the Mortal Kombat movie. And what okay. I love about his fight scenes are is his fight sequences advance the story. Like they don't just stop just to show a fight sequence. There's story developing and characterizations happening within that choreography. And I think there's a huge yeah. di difference between the spectacle and in story development. Right, I, I agree with that. In fact, the whole whole initial uh, sword fight in Princess Bride is teaching you about the training of, uh, you know, what the guy's name is, I can't remember, Indigo, Indigo Montoya, you know, and his father and, you know, the styles that he practices and the fact that he can, he can fight with either hand and, you know, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, when you, when you make the scene fun like that, the expositions, it's much more, it's better than just having two talking heads. They're actually doing something while delivering story with it. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and you know he showcases it throughout the movie. So, uh, you know, I, I, although that they do a bit of the click, click clacking, um, you know, because they, you don't want to pierce somebody's heart, you know, in a fun movie like that. So it's still very enjoyable. Um, well, I just want to thank you again so much. This is really an interesting insight into uh, Filipino stick fighting, and I love. Hearing you tell us about this in comparison to the way you teach Kempo and how the, it's really two different worlds. So I just want to thank you so much for the time you spent with us and to, and to go over this and to educate us a little bit on some of the deeper levels of the Filipino martial arts. Well, I, I, like I said, I always learn something when I go out to, uh, to do anything. And I love interacting with you because uh, you're you know, a learned martial artist. You hold uh, rank. Uh, you've trained in different styles. So the questions that you ask you know, beg more than, you know, what is your style and how did you get started? You know, so I, I, I liked our interaction. I appreciate it a lot. And don't forget, is the crane kick legal? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we did an episode on that, too. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but, but thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate it. Hopefully we can do it more. I'd like to extend a thank you to Master Vidal for his insight and for spending his time with us. I think there's a lot of good advice here for anyone who wants to implement weapons into their practice or sharpen the skills that they currently have. Now we hope to have him back on the show and again in the future and we invite all of you to share your experience and thoughts in the comments down below. I would also like to extend a thank you to Sensei William Christopher Ford for providing us footage from his own channel. Sensei Ford has a wonderful series as he talks to prominent instructors of other martial arts, so be sure to visit his channel, and we've provided the link to that channel down below in the description. So check out last week's episode if you missed it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you back on the mat next week.